So this is today, Integrating Science and Scripture. Now, caveat here. In my place today was supposed to be Zach Lawson to present this, but he couldn't be here today. So I am filling in for him. He is available via uh, Zoom. So if there's some question about the content that I'm not able to answer, we will try to get him to answer it through Zoom. There he just introduced himself um, grammatically in the chat of the Zoom. Okay, so let's, let's get started. So this is, the, uh, this is the big question, right? Evolution. So we'll, we'll get there. So remember last week. Last week we spent hours, okay, almost two hours on Genesis 1 to 11 and how to understand them in their context. So some of the takeaways from last week were that it was, it's important in order to understand a text, it's important to put yourself in the shoes of the author and audience that it was intended for. Um, and additionally, you have to cooperate with the author of the text to be able to get to what the meaning is that is being intended. Um, so you don't get to you know, place your modern presuppositions onto the text. Um, like Only the author gets to determine how the text is meant to be understood. Uh, additionally, Genesis is, is related in some way to other ancient Near Eastern texts, but the nature of this relationship is complicated. So you remember we, we looked at the Atrahasis epic, and we looked at um, the Sumerian king lists, and we saw some interesting similarities and some significant differences. Um, all of this leading into the idea that... Um, a number of people have come to classify Genesis 1 to 11 as uh, something on the order of mytho-history. So, um, a historicizing myth, a combination of an interest in history and um, mythic elements that are similar to other ancient Near Eastern uh, cultures' myths. So, in the context of what is the literary genre. Um, and ultimately, we decided that if that was a, a legitimate characterization, then this may mean that you can't assume that all of the details in Genesis 1 to 11 are intended to be historical, that you have to do a lot more kind of deep digging into understanding what's trying to be conveyed by the text to understand what it means. Now, this is going to be important for today because we're going to talk about different interpretations in the context of how Genesis relates to science. And so if you think back to last week a little bit, you'll start to see how that may or may not influence the way you're going to view these particular scientific issues. So, recapping again, biblical inspiration and biblical inerrancy. So as always at Rosh Christi, we are starting from the position of these traditional um, at least in the, in, in the context of inspiration, traditional Christian doctrines. Um, so we're going to say that the text is the, the work of human authors, but God stands behind it. And, and ultimately what, God, Bible teach, what the Bible teaches is true um, and without error in what it teaches or in what it affirms. So just as the background. Now, we're, there are a variety of scientific questions that you can, you can try to address in the context of Genesis. So you can ask what the age of the universe is or of the earth. You can ask where life came from. You can ask how did life diversify? How did human, uh, humanity originate? What is humanity's relationship to the rest of the biosphere? What are Adam and Eve's role in, in history? So there's all sorts of interrelated questions that you can ask. Today, we are going to focus on four in particular. And ultimately, our goal here is to seek an integrated view of reality that um, takes into account uh, the religious beliefs that we hold in addition to the scientific knowledge that the human race as a whole has accumulated. This is our goal just because we believe, uh, at least at Rosh Christi, that uh, God actually can communicate us things through nature, as is stated in uh, Romans 1.20. Um, so some people will say that God has given us two books, the, the Bible and nature, and they can't disagree. 
So today we're going to tackle four specific questions. So the first of these is how, is, how old is the universe? How is life related? How did life diversify? And then how did humanity originate? Now, oh, my clicker is not working. Okay, theology alert. So some of these questions will intersect and interact with theological issues. So today, we are actually going to focus on the first three questions because the interaction of these questions theologically is a lot less significant. However, that fourth line there has very, very important theological characteristics. So that fourth one we're going to save till next week. So if you're really interested in Adam and Eve, come back next week and we're going to spend an entire hour on Adam and Eve. But today we're going to talk about the age of the earth or the universe, um, how life, are, life is all related, and um, talk about how life diversified or was created diverse. Okay, so there are a lot of different isms that can describe views on origins. Now this is focusing on uh, g interpretations of Genesis and the rest of the Bible in the context of uh, the age of the earth, uh, as well as in the context of um, the origin of life. And so you can see there's this huge continuum. In the middle here, we have the kind of uh, typical, uh, normal kind of Christian views. We have the really extreme views being flat earthism and geocentrism there at the top. Uh, then at the bottom, we have all the way down to a materialistic evolution, which is obviously non-theistic. Um, and just to note that a, a bunch of these um, in the middle here could be considered part of the intelligent design movement. So we're not really going to talk much about intelligent design, uh, but there are a lot of people that hold a lot of these different positions that would classify themselves in, in the, uh, with that label. Okay, so we are going to attack three questions, like I said, the age of the universe, the degree of shared ancestry, and the mechanisms of life's diversity. And we're going to start with the age of the earth and or the universe. So for all three of these questions, we're going to start with just a really brief discussion of where it intersects with the biblical data, and then we'll move on to the scientific data, and then we'll try to draw some kind of conclusion. Okay, so the biblical data. So the question here is, how do we interpret the days of Genesis 1? So here is all of Genesis 1, or I mean through 2, 3, but this is the first section, right? I'm not going to read through this, but basically over a series of days, God creates different elements of the cosmos, um, including uh, mankind. So ultimately, to kind of really broadly characterize the views that you can have on this uh, in the terms of the, the days of Genesis 1, there are three broad categories of interpretation. The first is the literalistic interpretation, um, which we could call the sequential calendar day uh, view or the 144-hour view. Uh, secondly, we have uh, literal views that redefine the word yom, which is the Hebrew word for day. So this, uh, the one that we are going to talk about is the day-age view, but there are other kind of variations on that. Um, and then there are time agnostic views, and there's a whole bunch of these. These are just a couple of examples. And these time agnostic views basically take Genesis 1 to 11 to, as having nothing to do with a chronology or a timeline, that those are literary elements in some way. So an example of this would be the literary framework view. Um, or uh, those of you who are familiar with John Walton, he holds to the temple inauguration view. Uh, there are also analogical days and a whole bunch more views, um, but we're, we just have kind of a very small sampling. So starting with the calendar day, uh, consecutive calendar day view, um, here are the assumptions that you are making here or the assertions that you're making about the text. So the days in Genesis 1 are, one, literal, so literal 24 hours a day, 
So B, 24 hours long. C, sequential, and you might add non-overlapping. Uh, and D, that they occurred at the very beginning of creation. So now if you deny any one of those four things, you're going to wind up in a different view. Okay. Now, remember last week we talked about the importance of the genealogies in the book of Genesis. Um, so we're going to assess each of these views also with respect to how they look at the genealogies. So um, the literal calendar day view holds that the genealogies are literal, complete. Um, the ages and the, the lengths of time are literal and accurate, um, and they are not telescoped. That means that there aren't people missing. Okay. So if you actually do a calculation based on these assumptions, you can and people have, and I'll give you a summary in a second. If you look at the Septuagint, if you guys remember all the way back to two weeks ago, um, if you remember the, the Septuagint, the numbers in the Septuagint are all different from the Masoretic text. So you'll find that the earth is um, about 7,500 years old, but depending on how you do the calculation, um, the numbers won't necessarily line up exactly. So there's a plus or minus 63-year window of error there. Um, however, if you're looking at the Masoretic text, then you're going to wind up with about 6,000 years old, plus or minus 115 years. Now, there is a really long history of doing this calculation um, back to about 400 years ago. So uh, about 400 years ago, um, 350 years ago, 375 years ago, uh, Bishop James Usher compiled a chronology of the world based on the Genesis text, and he determined that creation happened on October 23rd, 4004 BC. Um, so this is kind of the accepted view among the Young Earth group, um, this particular date. Um, however, this date was not calculated, like I said, until Bishop Usher, Usher, Bishop Usher in the 17th century. So... Um, now, if you look in the fine text on here, you'll also see uh, a, a few dozen other people that have performed this calculation using various manuscripts and the different numbers that they get. Um, so the point is, you can do this calculation. There is uh, actually no accepted way to do the calculation. There's a lot of different, val uh, different variations, but all of them are going to give you something like 5,000 to 4,000 BC for the creation of the universe. Well, or at least of the Earth, but probably of the universe. Okay, so the second view that we discussed are, uh, is the day-age interpretation. So the idea here is that the days in Gen Genesis are still literal, yom, but it means age. So the word day in English can, can mean a day, 24 hours, but it can also mean an indefinite period of time, right? So in the day of my father. The same thing is true in Hebrew. So the argument here is that those words actually literally mean a long period of time, not a 24-hour period of time. Um, so these are indefinitely long, but sequential, probably non-overlapping, although in the illustration here, it is not non-overlapping. Um, and again, they occurred at the beginning of the creation. So you'll see here that we basically only changed one of these four requirements compared to the, the literalistic view. Now, both the literalistic view and this view are basically literal views of the text. Um, this one is just trying to change the chronology by changing the meaning of that word yom. Again, the genealogies here um, are considered to be mostly literal, but they are probably telescoped. They may or may not include literal ages of people. Again, you know, insofar as the, the idea here is to expand the timeline, um, you have to get away from the, the, time, the ages uh, and everything in the genealogies. Okay, and then we have these temporally agnostic views. So in these, typically uh, you're assuming that the days are not literal, that they are literary constructs that are designed to frame the narrative, uh, and that they're not intended to be taken as literal chronologies. So again, this is where you have to think back to our discussion last week of the genre. So the argument here typically is that the original readers would not have understood these to be a literal chronology. They would have understood it to be uh, a different genre of literature. 
Um, consequently, assessing the length is meaningless. Uh, and there's not even any real need to think of these as being sequential or in the right order or anything like that, um, because that's not necessarily what is what is being thought about. In the context of the genealogies, uh, different views are going to have different views of the genealogies. Some will think they're literal. Some will think they're non-literal. Um, they could or could not be telescoped. They may or may not include literal ages. So. Um, there's a huge variety of views here, and we'll get a lot more into this probably when we start talking a little bit about Adam, because we're going to have to talk about um, placing that you know, in past history. But uh, the idea with these here are that Genesis 1 to 11 um, is, is fulfilling some literary role that is not exactly uh, chronological. So you can't, you can't answer a lot of these questions. Okay, so that's the biblical data and the, you know, a very broad view of the interpretations. Now, it should be said that in the past, we have spent an entire meeting talking just about, you know, those three or maybe four interpretations. So this is all, everything we're doing today is going to be pretty, uh, pretty brief, and we're just going to scratch the surface. So if you have questions, we can, um, we can do a little bit of Q&A. So scientific data. Um, this is a relatively straightforward question to address scientifically. How old is the universe? How old is the Earth? Uh, and there are a lot of different data points that we can look at um, as to you know, what those ages might be. So, for example, uh, here I have lists of a few dozen different methods that have been used um, to assess the age of different geological things or um, you know, features of the universe as a whole. So there's a bunch of radiometric dating methods that all have different nuances. Um, if somebody's curious, we can talk a little bit, a little bit about the radiometric dating. It's really interesting. Um, radiometric dating has been done on terrestrial rocks as well as meteorites, as well as lunar rocks. So one of the results of the Apollo program. Um, then, additionally, you can try to date the universe as a whole, and there's a lot of complicated ways to do this, but you can get really rough estimates just by looking at how far away stars are and then thinking about how long it takes the light to travel from stars to Earth. And we'll talk about a few of these. So I think the most, uh, most important thing to talk about when we're talking about the age of the Earth or the solar system is going to be the radiometric dating of the lunar rocks. Now, if anybody has spent any time on the internet looking at people talking about radiocarbon dating or radiometric dating, you're going to see a lot of really kind of out there stuff. For one thing, radiocarbon dating is not really relevant for any of this. So radiocarbon is a nice radiometric dating method, and it only goes back like 20,000 years. So not relevant for any of these discussions. Um, but radiometric dating in general is very interesting. Some of the arguments that are made against it are based on potential contamination, which is a real concern. Um, so the nice thing about being able to pull rocks from the moon, there is no water on the moon. There is no atmosphere on the moon, and the moon has pretty much just sat there for a really long time. So where is like what's going to happen to the rocks to make their composition change? So the way radiometric dating works is that rocks are formed largely of crystals. And so crystals form um, known patterns of different, uh, different elements, right? So think about a salt crystal. You have exactly one-to-one -one ratio of sodium and chloride. So all minerals are the same way. So you have known ratios of elements together. Now, some elements are radioactive, and they will decay over time. So let's say you have a crystal that um, incorporates, uh, incorporates uranium into its structure. So over time, that uranium is going to decay and become lead. So with things like mass, spectro mass, spectrometry, mass spectrometry, we can actually measure the ratio of elements inside that crystal. And the longer that crystal has been around, the more lead there will be and the less uranium there will, there will be. And you know that that lead, there's not going to be very much lead in that crystal originally. 
Now, in, in the case of that particular dating method, there is some lead in there, so you have to go through even more steps to figure out how you can correct for the lead that was already present in the crystal. There are other methods where the byproducts won't be incorporated into the crystal at all, so it's, it's more like a one-step process. But again, we can talk about some of these uh, later. They are, um, there's a lot of them, and there's, it, it's quite complicated. Um, but again, lunar rocks are nice because they don't undergo any of the weathering processes that we have on Earth, so you can sidestep a lot of the arguments uh, against um, radiometric dating of things that are on Earth. Now, talking about starlight, so it's been possible to measure the distance to the stars for over 2,000 years. It's, qu it's quite simple using uh, parallax. So the Earth moves, and uh, because the Earth moves, that means the position of stars change a little bit. Depending on when you're on one side or the other side of the sun, you can use that to measure the distance from the Earth to a star. Once you know how far the star is, we know how fast light travels, and so you know how long it must have been, or you, you basically know how long that, how long ago that star existed at, at a minimum because that's how long it took its light to actually get to you. So we can see stars that are, um, you know, many, many millions of light years away. So consequently, they're at least that many millions of years old. Um, Interestingly, the, the farthest visible star is estimated to be about 9 billion years old. So that's a good question. Um, well, so let me say, the parallax calculation was done 2,000 years ago. I don't think that, I don't know that the distance calculation was done, although... The, so in terms of figuring out the age, they didn't figure out the age because they didn't know the speed of light. But finding the distance is just trigonometry. Um, now, I, how they figured out the distance to the sun, I don't know. That's something that Zach might know because he put this slide together. Uh, and he, has, he does have a citation here for this. So um, you, can, you can look at the citation and try to track that down. But I, I didn't read that, so you'll have to, you'll have to do a little digging. And then the last important data point here, which is a much more complicated example, basically of the previous slide, um, is using the cosmic microwave background radiation. So the Big Bang resulted in bright light everywhere. And so that's the furthest time back in history, and that light you can still measure by pointing a sensor to the sky. It was discovered you know, 70 years ago or something. Um, discovered accidentally, actually. And uh, as probably many of you know, the further away you go in the universe, because the universe is expanding, the light is shifted towards a lower frequency. So it starts being more white, then it becomes red. It's called redshift. But the further away it is, the more it shifts. And something that's 13.8 billion years ago gets sh shifted all the way until it's a microwave. So all the way from light with a really small wavelength like 400 nanometers, all the way to a, a microwave, which is more like on the order of centimeters or something like that. So you can get an idea of the age uh, by looking at how much that light has shifted towards the microwave spectrum, um, and, and then much more complicated math in this case. And that's where that 13.8 billion, uh, billion years old number comes from, because we're looking at that, that light that's uh, very far away. Okay, so to summarize here, we have these three views, the literalistic day, 24-hour, uh, 144-hour view, um, which says the Earth is around 10,000 years old, uh, and the universe probably. Um, and then we have the day, both the day age and the time agnostic views, which aren't going to specify any particular date from the text. So they will typically just accept the scientific data which says that the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old and the universe is almost 14 billion years old. Okay? Make sense? So that's what we have. So how to integrate. So um, only the kind of young Earth view here actually has a challenge. Um, so it's pretty much the only interpretation that it does. Obviously, if you go real extreme and fall in like the, 
geocentric <laughs> interpretation or the flat earth interpretation, uh, you're going to have troubles. Uh, but typically, those aren't that common anymore, although the flat earth thing has become a little bit weirdly more common. Um, again, it does come from the Bible, so it's the same, it's the same sort of an argument. Um, now, I will say that the day-age views may have some other challenges with chronology, uh, because the, if the days are supposed to be sequential, um, then it doesn't quite line up with things like biology, but we can talk about that later. Um, the uh, literalistic views do have a challenge, but there are three ways that you can deal with this challenge. So the first, you could just deny inerrancy and say that, well, this is what the Bible teaches and the, the authors got it wrong. That's probably not a tact anybody in here is going to take. Um, the second option is to basically just say, I know what the science says, I know what the Bible says, I don't know how to connect them together but I'm pretty sure of both of them. And we'll, we'll see somebody in a second here who actually takes that tact. And then lastly, uh, you could just uh, affirm that God created the universe with an appearance of age. That is, all these things are true. God basically created the world in an instant or over seven days, but with all the features that would lead us to believe it to be older. So we're not going to do that A1. So this is Dr. Paul Nelson. So he actually takes more or less that B um, route in his beliefs. So he, he has a famous quote that says, natural science at the moment seems to overwhelmingly point to an old cosmos. Uh, Though creationist scientists have suggested some evidences for a recent cosmos, none are widely accepted as true. It is safe to say that most recent, i.e. young earth creationists, are motivated by religious concerns. That is not scientific concerns. So if you want to hear more on this, we actually interviewed him on our podcast, uh, I don't know, maybe a year or so ago now. So you can find that, and we talked a little bit about this. Um, so you can, there's probably a 10 or 15 minute discussion on this topic. So um, you can take that view. This is not very common, but there are people who take this tact. Um, on the other hand, you can, uh, you can just kind of lean into the appearance of age, this is also surprisingly uncommon. So um, basically, like I said, this just says the cosmos looks old, but only because God created it mature. So the same way God created Adam, you know, with a belly button, you know, as an adult, he created the universe as an adult, okay? Now, the objection here is that this makes God a liar, that he's somehow deceiving. Um, I don't know what that's supposed to say, the VS. Maybe this assumes uniformitarianism. Um, so the idea here is that it doesn't mean that God is a liar. The idea is that um, God miraculously created the universe. If he chose to the universe to function in certain ways, he wanted certain features, naturally it's going to make it look like it was old, just like he chose to create Adam as an adult, so he looks old even though he had just been created. Um, so yeah. So um, some other examples of this in Scripture, Jesus turned water to wine, um, but he didn't allow any time for fermentation. Right? Um, stars were created to serve visible markers on Earth. So if you read Genesis 1, um, they're, they're created for a reason. And they can't serve that function if they're created and then they can't be seen. Right? So he created light in transit, basically. Adam and Eve were created sexually mature to pop populate the earth, which they couldn't have done if they were infants. Okay, so this is a legitimate uh, tact to take, uh, but again, for some reason, neither this nor the previous slide is actually a common, um, common tact to take. The more common tact is to lean into um, basically just denying the science uh, the traditional science. So to evaluate this a little bit, um, in principle, the appearance of age is, is consistent, is reasonable, uh, but there are a couple inconsistencies. Um, for example, uh, the oldest human remains seem to be much older than humans. While you can say that many things, appearance of age makes sense, uh, 
it doesn't make any sense why God would create remains of humans that never lived and bury them in the ground for us to find. Um, and so you can think about other things too, like dinosaurs and, and other things. But again, this is a defensible view, um, but it, it's not perfect. And actually, none of the views that we talk about in general are going to be perfect. So summarizing here, the Gen Genesis days can be interpreted in a bunch of different ways. They can be literal, they can be uh, 24 hours, they can be literal and not 24 hours, or they could be non-literal, in which case you have all sorts of leeway in the interpretation. The scientific data is at this point um, completely set that the Earth um, is you know, 4 billion years old and the cosmos is close to 14 billion years old. Um, and only the calendar day view uh, has any conflict with this. But, like I said, there are potential ways that you can address that. Okay, on to the next topic, and how far over time am I? Okay, pretty far. That's not surprising. So now we're going to talk about probably the, the more contentious topic, which is shared ancestry. So here is the tree of life. Um, you can't see it because it's too little. This is really giant. But there are lots of different branches on the tree of life. So biblical data. The, the primary biblical data that we have to interact with here is this idea of, of a kind. So uh, in Genesis, you'll see that God created animals to reproduce after their own kinds. And on the ark, there were all the different kinds of animals. So... The question is, what does this word mean? So there are basically three ways that you can interpret that specific word. Um, and remember that if you're thinking about this from the context of last week, it actually doesn't really matter which way you interpret men because the whole narrative is mytho-historical. So it could literally mean one of these things and in the context of the whole story, not have that meaning right? Not be teaching that, right? So just to throw that out there. But if you're looking at, trying to look at what that word means just in isolation, there are three options here. The first would be fixity of species. Um, so this is the idea that the kinds that are created by God are the original species, and there has been no transition or no extinction of those species or kinds. The second is variety. So this is that you're basically, the word men is just referring to variety within a broader group. So like all kinds of birds. So all the variations of birds or all kinds of creeping things, the variations of creeping things. And that this isn't intended to convey necessarily a biological idea. Um, and then lastly, you can talk about a taxonomic view, which uh, this is basically just saying gr phenomenological groupings of creatures that has nothing to do with their biological origin or interrelation. It's just human language grouping animals together for convenience of description into common categories. Again, not necessarily having anything to do with biology. So th this is one of the challenges to realize that the ancient authors were probably not using this word, to, especially in Genesis, to define creatures based on a kind of useful biological criteria. Um, in fact, in John Collins's book that we discussed last week, he has a, a, a portion where he discusses how uh, the categories that are used in Genesis 1 to 11 are completely unhelpful um, in an agrarian society because it doesn't distinguish between you know useful types of animals and like wild animals and it doesn't distinguish between any of the things that that society would actually distinguish so um, it probably isn't like a supposed to be a really important biological grouping so uh, there are basically three different ways that we can look at the uh, the, the tree of life, right? So we have on the left here, this is the more traditional scientific view, which is the universal tree of life or universal common ancestry, where all animals go back to a single origin. Then you can have this idea of, a, of local common ancestry or the orchard of life, where you have multiple starting points and then branching out from those. Um, or you could have the lawn of life, where basically every animal is just created and there's no change. Now, 
All of these are compatible with different interpretations of that word. So the taxonomic could be any of them. The variety um, could really be in a, any of them too. Um, fixity uh, could apply to either of the two on the right. Now, again though, if you're taking the view of the text that we presented last week, it doesn't matter because no matter the way they're using that word, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're teaching anything about the animals in, in terms of how they're related or how they changed over time. So there were actually a few um, early Christian anticipations of something like um, uh, common ancestry or um, you know change between animals. So, for example, here's Basel. And he says, because there is, so to say, a family link between creatures th that fly and, and that swim. Um, so he's talking about why do waters also give birth to birds? So he's basically saying these are re related in some kind of familial sense. Because they're both, in, both endowed with the property of swimming, one through air and one through water. Um, additionally, uh, probably more interestingly, Calvin's view of creation, John Calvin... Um, who any of you who are from a Reformed tradition um, know very well, had a very unusual view of Genesis 1. And basically, he decided that all things, God basically created everything as an undifferentiated mass, and then through secondary causes, that blob that he created became everything else, including all living things. Um, now, ironically, he also believed that this happened over seven days, so John Calvin would, technically speaking, be a young earth evolutionist. Just throwing that out there. So you guys can read through these at your leisure uh, later on. Uh, but basically, this is, uh, this is coming uh, to us through B.B. Um, Warfield actually commenting on Calvin um, and noting that this is an interestingly evolutionary scheme. Yes, that's very important. And actually, uh, where is that? That's on, that's on the slides here somewhere. Yes, so first line, uh, for all except the souls of men, an uh, evolutionary scheme. So he is clearly distinguishing uh, the souls of men. Interestingly, though, not the bodies of men. So a very nuanced view, you know, more than 500 years ago. Well, I guess maybe a little less than 500 years ago. A long time ago. Okay, so that was our scientific and biblical, or that was our sci uh, biblical and a little bit of historical data. What about scientific data? Now, this is a huge topic, and we're just going to like brush a couple of things. So don't shoot me. You know, no matter what side of this argument you're on, we're just going to scratch the surface. So there's a couple of things that lead us to believe that all um, uh, or most living things are related to one another, um, biologically speaking. So uh, one good example of this is the shared genetic machinery, so, uh, as well as the shared genetic code. So DNA is a molecule, and that molecule codes proteins um, really in a directly analogous way uh, to any other code. Uh, we represent DNA as series of letters, uh, A, T, G, and C, and each of those, each triplet of those letters then corresponds to a particular amino acid. That amino acid could have been any amino acid, but it corresponds for a particular one. Every animal, the same three letters correspond to the same amino acid with uh, a few, I think, minor differences between um, like bacteria in some cases, I think. But then, not only that, the machinery that actually creates these things also is shared between all life. So if you take a piece of DNA from a bacterium and implant that into a mammal cell, you can produce the same protein, or vice versa. That was a famous experiment that was done, um, showing that the RNA that's produced um, there are, the RNA that codes for a protein is transcribed the same way depending on, uh, regardless of, of what animal it's in or plant or whatever. Um, another, I think, more potent example here, so we can talk a lot about how genetics 
uh, are shared between living creatures. So uh, we all share a large amount of our DNA because we're related as humans. We also share a lot of DNA with chimpanzees and bonobos and you know other uh, other apes. You know, kind of less similar. All the way, you know, we share DNA with all mammals and with all quadrupeds and with all vertebrates and with all animals. And like I said, even with bacteria and things like that. So um, you can see an interrelation, but I, what's even more interesting is not only do we share the information that produces our bodies or describes our bodies, we also share information that has been accidentally accrued over time. So one good example of this are called endogenous retroviruses. So for those of you who don't know what a retrovirus is, this is a virus, you know, an illness that you get, and that virus, when it attacks a cell, it actually retranscribes its RNA into DNA, and then that DNA gets inserted into the nucleus of the actual cell that it's, um, that it's attacking. And that can actually become permanently incorporated into that cell. Very rarely, this will happen in germline cells, so in sperms or egg, that then get reproduced and passed on to offspring. So that little virus then, the genome of that virus is permanently recorded in the all progeny of that animal. And what's interesting is that you can then go look through the genetic code and you can find these. Because viruses do specific things and they look a certain way and you can find these in all of our DNA. And interestingly, we share retroviruses, that some that we share just with other primates. We share some that we share just with other mammals. Some that we share with even more uh, vertebrates. So this is more interesting because it actually shows a change that was added into an organism and then passed on to its progeny over time. So here's an illustration of this, uh, a number of different retroviruses that you can find um, in different places. So I had a suggestion that said I need to be more specific. Would you clarify? Okay, never mind. That is not for me. Okay. So how do you integrate this together? So the variety and proto-taxonomic interpretations of men, or a mytho-historical interpretation in general, are broadly compatible with any view that we would care to take. However, if you adhere to the fixity of species, you know, that interpretation of the word men, then you're not going to be able to uh, accept the traditional scientific view. This on the bottom here is an alternative view proposed by um, some recent creationist. Um, and this shows basically a variety of animals existing, kind of spreading into different, you know, similar varieties. Then that blue line is a flood that kills them all, except for one or a pair. And then that pair spreads out really rapidly and produces new types, uh, new variations as well. So this is the alternative. So now an argument here against this idea of common descent is called common design. So this is the idea that if all living things are created by the same designer, wouldn't it be reasonable for that designer to reuse parts of simpler designs in his more complex designs, right? So look at our Corvette there. It is not super different from all the previous ones. So you can see a progression, but that doesn't mean it evolved. It just means that a designer started with the previous design and then added or subtracted things, right? Um, or the common example that's used is actually different brands of cars. Just because they share similar designs doesn't mean they're related in any way. So how do we evaluate this? So this actually does potentially, like in, in principle, this addresses a lot of the issues uh, when you're talking about the genetic evidence for common ancestry. However, it does not uh, successfully or very um, comprehensively address the idea of these non-functional parts of the genetic code, like the uh, endogenous retroviruses, like I described, or other things called pseudogenes. So these are genes that mutated and were shut off at some time in the past, but all the progeny still have them. So for example, um, humans don't smell so good, right? 
we have a particular gene that makes people smell good that's been broken for a really long time, and we share that same broken olfactory gene with other primates. Um, so th those are the sorts of things that this does not, dis does not explain as well. Okay, so that is everything about common ancestry in 15 or 20 minutes. I'm sure that anybody is, has now changed their mind because I presented so much great information, right? Now, the last thing we're going to talk about here is mechanisms of life's diversity. So if common ancestry is the case to some extent, how do you get this variation? How do you get bacteria you know, to a sponge, to a monkey? So, starting as always with the biblical data, we're first going to ask, how do we interpret God's activity in creation? So the Bible does say at least something about the way living things were created, and then we'll jump on to the scientific data. So, uh, Genesis 1-2 to actually say, they provide almost no helpful information on this. Um, in particular, um, God says, let the earth bring forth a bunch of things, and then he says, let the sea bring forth other things, and then he molds man out of dirt, which could mean all sorts of different things. And that's pretty much what Genesis says. No, like Basically, no helpful information. Now, in Psalm 104 and Job 38 and 40, um, there are additional accounts of creation. However, they are more poetic than Genesis is. Um, and they more talk about God's actions in the world and sustaining natural cycles of things like predation and rain and seasons. So, ultimately, the Bible tells us basically nothing about how we got different types of animals, other than that God, quote, let the earth bring forth the creatures. So, summary of the biblical data. We have two slides. Biblical data, summary. Could have probably done with one slide, because there's not much here. Um, it basically, this is supposed to say doesn't, it doesn't propose a specific causal mechanism. It just said God created everything, in the, or God commanded the earth to create everything or, or um, generate all living things. Secondary causes and natural cycles are used in God's creating and sustaining the universe. Again, God doesn't directly create it. He says, let the earth bring forth. Um, but importantly, creation was not purposeless. God created things for purpose. So, that was just a great wealth of biblical data, wasn't it? So, now we're going to move on to the scientific data and talk a little bit about how different people view how biological diversity can be produced. So, Charles Darwin had an original theory of, of evolution a long time ago, uh, and he had these four key ideas here. One, more individuals are produced each generation than can survive. So there's always going to be some portion of the population that has to die. Um, phenotypic variation exists among, among individuals, and that variation is habitable. So that means differences in their outward uh, abilities um, or construction, and that those are habitable. The thing, or her heritable, the things that are in red here would later be changed. Uh, those ind individuals with heritable traits better suited to the environment will tend to survive more frequently, thus those traits will become more prevalent in the population. When reproductive isolation occurs, new species will form. Okay, two and three had to be changed at some point. So, oh, wrong place. So we, um, Darwinism actually was almost immediately revised. Those, those two middle points had to be changed. So the fossil record was discontinuous, suggesting gaps in evolution. It was argued that many structures were non-adaptive or functionless, so they could not have evolved under natural selection. Natural selection was argued to not be creative, while variation was admitted to be mostly not of value. So natural selection can't create new traits. Most variations within populations don't contain anything particularly interesting, so you're not, it's going to be hard to get something new. Uh, 
So almost immediately, Darwinism was revised, and eventually we get what is called the modern synthesis. So this is the addition of Mendelian genetics. So this provides a mechanism for inheritance. So now we know that there are genes, and those genes are inherited. Population genetics provides the mathematical fr uh, framework for actually assessing how these traits are passed on. Um, but ultimately, the modern synthesis still ultimately was committed to gradualism, which that all changes would happen slowly over time. And ultimately, the key words, uh, the key description of this here is that random variation or random mutation plus natural selection plus time equals evolution. So you have small changes or small mutations are naturally selected for the ones that are positive plus a really large amount of time and you can eventually get new traits and eventually whole new species. So Darwin laid down the gauntlet very early on. He said, um, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find no such case. And we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that point here in a minute. Now, um, a very famous uh, contemporary is Dr. James Shapiro. Um, and he is a big proponent for modifying the, uh, the modern synthesis into what um, proponents call the extended synthesis. So the idea here is that um, you know, basically little evidence fits unequivocally with the theory that evolution occurs through the gradual accumulation of numerous slight modifications. So the fossil record definitely does not show a continuous variation of forms. Um, there are a lot of structures um, that are challenging to explain through single base pair mutations happening very slowly over time. Um, so there are a lot of challenges with the traditional, at least the traditional um, description of the modern synthesis. So Michael Behe accepted that gauntlet that, that Darwin threw down, um, and he argues that there are clear examples of things in nature that cannot be produced by numerous success, uh, slight modifications. So his original um, famous example was the bacterial flagellum, which, I mean, that was in uh, not this book, but it was in this book, Darwin's Black Box, which was published in, like, the 90s, I think. This is, I think, the 10-year anniversary edition of that book. Um, long time ago. So, again, also, you can find a conversation we had with him on our podcast last year or the year before. Um, so you can check that out and see a little bit more discussion of some of these things. Um, so Behe has really argued that there are definitely examples of things that can't happen through the traditional mechanism of single-point mutations slowly accumulating over time. Because we have tools and ability to see things that Darwin couldn't see. Darwin thought that cells were little boxes of goop. But now we know that cells are these incredibly complex molecular machines, and something like a bacterial flagellum is this complex structure of proteins, and if you get rid of one of those proteins, it doesn't work. And it takes hundreds or thousands of mutations to change that into something else that's useful. So ultimately, the challenge here has been that it's relatively easy to look back in time you know, and, and uh, see how life is interrelated. We just went through all the evidence for common ancestry. However, when you try to move forward through time and pr uh, provide a mechanism for that occurring, um, that is very challenging. So um, there are different ways that you can try to bridge this gap. So the intelligent design movement and people like Michael Behe are basically saying that, look, all of this happened. So Michael Behe is a, holds to typical evolutionary theory, he just says that you had to have an intelligent agent intervene at key times to, to kind of make these leaps in the evolutionary process. Or, on the other hand, you have this uh, extended synthesis, which is 
adding new natural mechanisms to that idea of um, mutation plus natural selection. Um, so Michael Behe is actually going to say that um, you can very easily get variation within this kind of species or even genera level um, through the natural selection and random mutation. But he's going to say that higher order um, changes, especially at like the phyla level, uh, you, you can't get through these single point mutations or even multipoint mutations. Uh, and then there's this edge in there where you know, maybe evolution could account for things all the way up to the border, uh, the level of order. And so you can read about this in his book, The Edge of Evolution. Again, friend of the podcast. Now, uh, James Shapiro um, is, like I said, part of this extended synthesis idea. So he says, the only issue that has effectively been settled in a convincing way is the evidence for a process of evolutionary change over the past three billion years. Um, however, little, little evidence fits unequivocally with the theory that evolution occurs through the gradual accumulation of numerous successive slight modifications. On the contrary, clear evidence exists for abrupt events of specific kinds at all levels of genome organization. We must search for alternative conceptual foundations that better account for our current knowledge of genome change over evolutionary time. So this has been something that, this is a conversation that is not new. Um, people have actually said that the modern synthesis has been dead since the 1970s. Like since the 1970s, it has been known that merely uh, random mutation and natural selection could not account for much of the diversity that we see. And so other mechanisms have been sought. But for some reason, this knowledge has not filtered down to the popular level or even into like college biology books. Um, so the perceived need to reject supernatural intervention unfortunately led pioneers of evolutionary theory to erect a, an a priori philosophical distinction between blind processes of hereditary variation and all other adaptive functions. So Shapiro is actually claiming that the, the bias against or the, the ingrained desire to avoid supernatural intervention is causing some kind of a suppression of the, uh, the need to update uh, the modern synthesis. And he's not proposing supernatural influences. He's just saying there are other mechanisms than, than random mutation. Get that. So there's a another nice book here that I brought with me. This is called Evolution 2.0 by Perry Marshall. Now he's not an expert in any of this stuff. He's like an engineer and he does uh, like IT type stuff. But um, it's a really nice inter introductory book to these concepts of the extended synth synthesis. So from his book, he actually notes five different ways, um, other mechanisms that allow genetic diversity uh, to be introduced into uh, living organisms. So the first is transposition. So DNA repairs damage by replacing broken parts with replicable, replicable sections in other chromosomes. So this leads to changes in the DNA, mutations that can change or improve DNA, creating offspring with these changes. So you can get big changes with this. Because you can have whole sections of DNA getting shuffled around. You can also have horizontal gene transfer. So this means that you can actually have genes that are transferred between organisms. So anybody who's ever studied bacteria knows that this is common. Bacteria will produce these plasmids, which are little rings of, of DNA, and then they will connect to each other and exchange these rings of DNA. And they can do this across species. And if DNA is kind of floating loose in the environment, it can be taken up by cells of many different species. So you can get whole new sets of genetic information all at once through horizontal gene transfer. And there's evidence in the history of life where this has happened, where you can see whole chunks of DNA from another organism in the genome. Go ahead. Oh, you would definitely have to look at this book or somewhere else. I do not have that off the top of my head. Zach in the chat may have. So the question was, what's an example of horizontal gene transfer? 
I do have a, uh, one of the later slides I think has a little diagram that shows this, but it, not in any detail. It just shows a tree of life with a couple little side spots. But it, it doesn't really give a clear and obvious example. Um, I think there are some in this book though, because he goes through at a real high level some of the key research. Uh, one thing bacteria have isn't just like their main genome, but they have like little tiny circles of... Yeah, the plasmids. Yeah, plasmids of like DNA. And those plasmids can end up being transferred from one organism to another without like reproduction or anything. So it's like those, those plasmids are also not necessarily for specific bacterial species. So another bacteria can find a dead bacteria of same or a different species and they can take those plasmids and they can use those as, their, as if it's their own DNA. And so it can transfer across the species that way, or yeah, other and, bacteria. And this is something that is, that precise thing that you just described is, can, can easily be observed in a lab. This is not a kind of random occurrence. This is common. Um, what's more interesting is when you can find evidence of these that significantly altered the course of uh, uh, divergence of species in the past. I don't have a clear example of that. I think there might be some in this book. I just don't have one off the top of my head. Um, um, mitochondria has been cited in the Zoom as an example. Uh, this is not, that's symbiogenesis. That is not horizontal gene transfer, but we will get there. <laughs> but Zach is very, very heavily hitting that. Um, so epigenetics is another area. So anybody who pays attention to current medical research um, will have heard this word epigenetics. It is a really hot area because it turns out that as important as your genes are all of the um, external mechanisms that switch those genes on and off. And so epigenetics is basically just the set of genes that are switched on or off in your genome. And that's inheritable. So whatever genes are switched off in your mother's genome get passed to you, switched off, or on, or vice versa. Um, but that is, that is an acquired trait. So, for example, um, there was a pretty famous study that showed that uh, children who were born in times of famine, so when their parents were very, uh, had, uh, had did, like their mothers did not have enough food to eat, so when they're born and then um, when they're very young, then once they grow up, they have different uh, metabolic profiles. So they tend to um, have a slower metabolism because those genes were all switched on and off in such a way to maximize survival in a low resource environment. So these are really important because you can get all sorts of weird variations through epigenetic changes. So switching genes on, switching genes off, and you can get different phenotypes without changing the gen genetic code at all. Additionally, you can have symbiogenesis. <laughs> so symbiogenesis is this idea that sometimes a cell can ingest another cell, and instead of de destroying that cell, that internal cell will start functioning with the parent cell. So it's generally accepted that this is how mitochondria came to be, and this is how chloroplasts came to be. So you had a bigger... Uh, cell that basically ate a little mitochondria cell, and over time that mitochondria lost all of its ability to do things other than just break down glucose and make ATP, because the parent cell provided all of that. So even today, in all of your cells, you have mitochondria. Your genome does not tell your body how to make mitochondria. Those mitochondria independently reproduce, they have their own DNA inside of them, and they produce ATP for your, for your cells, but they're not part of your genome. They have their own thing going. So you can use this to track lineages of people because you have the same mitochondria that your mother had. Um, so this is really interesting because this also can be demonstrated in a lab. So that's obviously a huge change, right? You, you all of a sudden have this whole new thing inside of a cell. Um, and you can make things like this happen in the lab by combining different species together. In, and in a very short period of time, you can get a collection of cells 
that can't survive with any one type of cell removed. Uh, and lastly, you can have genome duplication. So in rare cases, so uh, for example, when, you, uh, when two species, uh, different species interbreed, uh, they, you can wind up with a situation where you have double the number of uh, chromosomes. Usually that is fatal, right? Or, or, or will result in an animal that's sterile, but sometimes that animal can still reproduce with other crossbreeds, and you can go from having 13 chromosomes to all of a sudden having 26. So you can double the amount of genetic information. And now imagine all the things that can happen with transposition, for example. So all sorts of weird things can happen. All sorts of genes will get switched off and on. You have all this new real estate, and you can have really rapid changes that occur once that happens. Is this typically like something that happens like in bacteria, or is there like an example of like more? No, genome duplication is going to be for sexual reproduction. I mean, I, that might could happen in, in bacteria too, but this particular example is, yeah. is sexual there's reproduction. Of that. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a lot of plants, and just it, that's more likely to occur in, the, um, uh, in plants than in like animals. I don't know, I, there might have been some that have occurred in animals, but generally speaking, just due to how reproduction works and some slight differences between the two, uh, usually when it happens in animals, it's lethal, but in plants, it's less likely to be lethal, and so there's more instances of it of occurring. That is how you get seedless watermelons. But seedless watermelons can't reproduce, because so you basically get double genome, but then they don't make seeds. So that's how you get it. But the question is, how do you get one that then can reproduce, right? And so, uh, again, I don't have the specific example, but in, the, in this book, there is one particular example where there's a proposed... Um, species that has basically twice as many genes as its previous species, like this family of organisms, and it's believed that that's how it was produced, that it basically had a, a genome duplication um, from this related animal, um, and that resulted in an organism with twice as many genes. And I mean, I think basically this is what's assumed uh, how most like increases in the number of um, of chromosomes happen, um, but again, I don't I don't have any of the specific examples. But it should be fairly easy to Google, I would think. But if nothing else, there is at least a brief example in the Evolution 2.0 book. So the point here is that there are lots of other alternative mechanisms that are part of the way genetic diversity occurs. Uh, it's not random mutation plus, plus natural selection. Um, these are all well-established things that evolutionary biologists l interact with, but for some reason, it, it just never gets talked about. So um, here is that diagram that I was telling you about that shows um, some examples of this um, horizontal gene transfer. Well, the green is a horizontal gene transfer, the orange is a, um, uh, the symbiosis. And you can see that this is a much more complicated tree of life. Because it's not just a tree and then a branch. There's all sorts of other weird things that are happening, um, which are not well understood, and so it's really complicated. But the point is, um, it's not just random mutation plus natural selection. and for some reason, this has not really filtered down. Part of the reason is because some of these mechanisms um, would lend themselves to interpretation as being uh, more like divinely controlled or something. Uh, because basically, a lot of these enable organisms to change their DNA. There's also something called natural genetic engineering, which wasn't on this list. Um, but there are ways that organisms can change their DNA in purposeful ways, you know, in ways towards beneficial mutation. So not by chance, not random. Um, and just that idea tends to make people nervous because then they think it's going to get picked up by um, like anti-evolutionist type people and, and cause trouble. So takeaways. 
Genesis allows for variations, uh, various interpretations and does not commit readers to a singular understanding of uh, the diversity of life. Um, importantly, it's really important that we hold some charity um, with respect to others, that we treat people with respect, realizing that you know this is a difficult question, and just because somebody disagrees with you doesn't mean they're a heretic. It uh, doesn't mean that they're you know somehow a liberal compromiser or something like that. Um, there are a lot of different views that you can take, and they don't really cause huge problems with the Bible. Now, there are a lot of interpretations uh, for the days of Genesis in the history of Christianity. I actually, if somebody's interested, have some more slides about the history of interpretation of the days. Um, but in general, most of them don't commit readers to a particular age of the earth. There are numerous interpretations of kinds. Many are compatible with various degrees of shared ancestry. And the modern synthesis um, slash neo-Darwinist paradigm of natural selection on random mutation doesn't really describe uh, biology. So for one thing, we should stop kind of attacking that perspective um, and, and start looking at kind of the more complex reality um, and then also not let uh, not let a you know more secularist person use the idea of random mutation and natural selection to to undermine something like teleology or or a purpose behind design. Okay, so that's it, guys. I think that I did better than last week on time, didn't I? Yeah, I get thumbs up. So apparently, I didn't wait too long. Do we have any other questions or comments? Uh, there's just a lot of stuff here. No? We, we'd uh, also love to hear from anybody in the Zoom. Yeah, that is an excellent point. Uh, let me put my earpiece in. If somebody in the Zoom would like to chime in, I will, I will listen. My question about the... You know, the modern synthesis, you said, pretty much been dead since 1970, right? Uh, and, but the extended synth synthesis isn't specifically, you know, taught or accepted or taught or whatever in academia. It, do you consider it like, I know the Big Bang Theory was the same way. They, they resisted um, all of that science because they thought it might, um, that it, it implied uh, God, you know, and so do you look at it like that, that it's just going to take that much time to, or do you got, you're going to need specific evidence for the extended synthesis for it to come into academia? Yeah, so the question is about the extended synthesis um, and its acceptance or non-acceptance and how long that might take. So we talked to uh, Josh Swamidas about this question. We, as well as Michael Behe. So interestingly, they both think the, the idea of the extended synthesis is stupid. So um, Swamidas uh, basically said that, well, the extended, you know, these are, these are well accepted mechanisms um, that people already use. So why do we need to create a new theory to incorporate these things we've already incorporated, right? So it's kind of a, a naming issue, right? Because um, they already use, like, these are accepted phenomena. Um, but the, where, and B, on the other hand, would rather address the, I think, the random mutation natural selection because, you know, that's what he's arguing against. But it's just, it's weird to me that this is happening because um, if people defending evolution would stop beating the random mutation plus natural selection drum, like they could defeat Behe's argument. But nobody's tried to do that. Like there are all these other mechanisms, so all you have to do is propose that maybe one of these other mechanisms is res responsible. <laughs> and then Behe would have to use a completely different framework to try to address that concern. So, um, but it's not done. I, I don't know. So some of you may remember that there was a conference in the UK a few years ago, um, it's probably many years ago at this time, maybe eight years ago, um, that was focused on the extended synthesis. And there were a few um, kind of intelligent design people and stuff that went there. 
and made a big deal of it because the whole point of the conference was to say, look, neo-Darwinism or the modern synthesis is insufficient. Not saying that, therefore, intelligent design, just saying that we need to highlight these mechanisms as a significant part of evolution. Uh, but of course, then the news cycle was, you know, Darwinism is dead, right? Um, but again, I don't understand, I don't understand the, the thought process here. I think there's just a huge groupthink that is so, that just not willing to give up an inch of ground that they can't give up that random mutation plus natural selection banner um, because it would be giving up, giving in to the, uh, to the ID people or to the young earth creationist or something. I don't know. Zach might have other thoughts to that. It seems like it, it shows them maybe to be intellectually dishonest. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, the, the, the lengths to which people seem to have gone to, like, at least according to Perry Marshall, there are basically no biology books that talk about these mechanisms, for example, you know, at a collegiate level. Although, I, I, so if they admitted purpose, it would be just, it would be awful. I mean, I I just, just, just not say God, let's just say, if somehow yeah. it was the some fact, if it, some direction. if it had to be the case that maybe they're what, that, that they always saw teleology and not blind, you know, not blind purposes, I mean, blind yeah. uh, mechanisms, I, then that would also be just yeah. terrible. In the Our, chat, Zach says that, yeah, that basically the extended synthesis people are using language that is similar enough to the intelligent design camp that it makes people, it gives a, a, a negative reaction to it, I guess. So, uh, so an example he gives is self-directed adaptation. So I, I think it, a lot of it is just a, a extreme reluctance to permit any sort of directedness towards the, the process. Actually, the main reason behind this is more, a lot of this stuff is like, even with like 1970, like even if we were, we were to say that that's kind of the time period where the modern synthesis was dead, a lot of this stuff is very new in science. Like a lot of these concepts are things that I'm learning in my genetics class or have, I've learned like a brief summary or understanding of them in previous science classes and just due to scientific inquiry, watching a lot of videos and information on this stuff. And then I'm learning a little bit more in depth about this stuff, like in my genetics class, like right now. But whenever we're talking, whenever it's talking about this, it might just be that I didn't hear it mentioned at the time, but I didn't hear it referred to as the extended synthesis. I just heard about like, this is um, different ways that evolution happens or the different mechanisms behind evolution. So maybe it's just the naming is weird or maybe it's just, it's new enough that not ever it hasn't been fully incorporated into the scientific community but i to me it didn't i don't or being in like a genetics class where i'm learning about this stuff and it's not like i don't have any problem with it i i, I should probably mention that i'm actually i'm actually an atheist but i don't have like any problem with any of this stuff yeah. and like accepting it and talking to people about it so i think it's more of just it hasn't been filtered through the scientific community as much or it hasn't been it just hasn't spread as much as it should have. It should be, for reasons, I don't, maybe some of the reasons that he mentioned. But yeah, so I think the the best example of this. So transposition was initially published in 1951 by um, somebody named Barbara McClintock, um, who is actually I think James Shapiro, who I talked about earlier. He was I think a student of McClintock, um, which is why he's kind of in this in this area, I think. Um, but she was basically laughed at. And it took decades and decades um, for her to actually get, you know, for, for this idea to gain acceptance. Uh, and eventually she won a Nobel Prize for it, but not until 1983. Um, so, I mean, it took 33 years and, and it wasn't even recognized as being, um, being, you know, even, you know, anything legitimate at all until uh, about 1970, it says. So, in the 70s. So it took her 20 years to accrue enough information to to uh, convince people that this was actually happening. 
Um, so I think that's part of the, the challenge here is that there really is a just extreme reluctance to deviate from the dogma of random mutation plus natural selection. Uh -huh. I, I would also like to note that it feels like there isn't enough of a division between retro or, or like forensic <laughs> retrospective analysis of evolution and uh, prospective mechanisms and actually is describing what accomplishes evolution. And so whenever I was learning about this in middle school, obviously there's not going to be a ton of depth into the subject. And then whenever you learn about it in high school, there's honestly not much more. Um, but having that division would have helped because then I can understand it is a little bit different than other scientific theories because some of it's going to be um, you, you have to propose what happened, but you can't test what happened. You can test certain mechanisms and you can observe certain mechanisms, but as far as examining the history, you're just putting together pieces. So Zach um, added into the, the chat that Perry Marshall overstates the case that these mechanisms are uh, are discussed at the collegiate level, just not at the most basic level. But importantly, they haven't made it into the common parlance. Or and it, basically, you still have the the idea that it you know the core part of um, of all of this is just random mutation plus natural selection. Any other comments or questions? I have the Zoom earpiece in if you want to talk. Too much about how like low and grain like the uh, random mutation plus natural selection really is, but it's like I guess to me from what little I do know, it would seem like it's a little bit more ingrained given what you've said, because like in physics, for example, like if something like that came up where it's like, oh, this old idea is largely wrong, like that would definitely be a caveat that would make when they would talk about it, right? But it seems like a lot of people don't really care to make that caveat, you know what I mean? Uh, so just from my perspective, kind of like from the outside, it seems like these other fields of science kind of like at, maybe have like different standards, I don't know, that maybe biology should have, right? Like, if we kind of like disagree that this is the main uh, like contributing factor, right, or like an important contributing factor, then that should be mentioned, you know, whereas it doesn't seem like it is a lot, so. Yeah, I, I think the issue is that whenever you have a contentious kind of emotional topic, it you all, you lose all that, that uh, objectivity, right? I think that's a clear example of this. And, you know, I will say that, so I read this book, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, actually. And uh, I was not familiar with any of this. I know Zach had been into the extended synthesis stuff for a year or so. Um, but this is probably, this book is the best case for evolution written by somebody from a religious perspective that I've ever read. Because all of the things that, you know, if you're from a religious background in America, you've heard all the arguments against evolution, and some of those probably still resonate a little bit. And this addresses all of that stuff. It addresses all the stuff from, from Michael Behe, which is why it's a shame that the weird discussion um, in our, the public sphere has kind of hidden this, because it would probably just diffuse the issue for a lot of people. Um, because it's a lot more complicated. So you can't, if you're looking at all these mechanisms, all this complicated stuff, you can't any longer kind of use it to try to exclude God from the picture because it's just too complicated to even, like nobody really knows exactly how everything works. Uh, but you also can't use it to just, you know, find a simple, clear example of how evolutionary theory can't demonstrate this and, you know, that's going to be the flag that I plant. It just makes it a much more kind of deep and interesting um, discussion. I would highly recommend this book. Again, this guy is not, Perry Marshall is not an expert in any of this, uh, but he does a really good job of introducing a bunch of things. I listened to it on Audible um, over uh, two car rides to and from my in-law's house. So. Um, he basically just falls into the traditional camp. So he, he feels the same way about it that he feels about ID. Uh, 
for for the same reasons basically he he's very much bought into uh, a view of theistic evolution that sticks very closely to the the biological party line and so he doesn't say that any of those things aren't happening but just that it's fine it's being incorporated into our current theory and there's nothing going on in terms of kind of not highlighting different parts of uh, of what we believe actually works in evolution you should listen to the to the podcast because it was a very dismissive very dismissive response and it's just such a cool area and this is kind of his stuff too i'm just really surprised again i think it's just the he's towing the party line in terms of you know these are all cool things but we got to stick to the 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 way we always have done things right any other questions from the zoom i have my ear in again Dinosaurs. Okay, Zach just yelled the word dinosaurs. So, did you have a did you have a slide for that or something, Zach? Uh, I started. I didn't finish. I just wanted to talk about dinosaurs. I did add a bunch of stuff about that. Okay, dinosaurs in the Bible. I don't think there's much to say about this, but if you think that dinosaurs had to coexist with people then you're going to find all sorts of weird things in the Bible that you're going to label a dinosaur. Ta-da! Job's Leviathan, for example. Um, or look at cave art and look at some poor, poor drawings of buffalo and d- decide that they're dinosaur. Um, that, that's a real thing, actually. You can Google that on the Internet. Um, and then dragons, of course, obviously are evidence of, of uh, dinosaurs. So, I don't, I don't know what Zach wanted to say about this, but... Uh, this is a clear trend, right? You can see, trying to find Bible uh, dinosaurs in the Bible. Now, in reality, like the Leviathan is like a, a specific thing in the context of the ancient Near East that has very specific cultural meaning um, that was really not anything about an actual animal. Um, so it, it wouldn't really make sense. Leviathan is like a chaos monster. Um, Kind of like Tiamat in the Enuma Elish, if you remember that discussion last week. Okay, my ear is in. Leviathan has seven heads and shoots fire from its nose. It's not even close to an actual dinosaur. Okay, Zach makes the point Leviathan has seven heads and shoots fire from its mouths or something like that. So again, not a dinosaur. It's a dragon, duh. Well, there you go. Any other questions? Oh, so there are some very rare fossils that actually have fossilized like skin and scales and things. You can actually see one plug at the Brazos Museum of Natural History. Did you know we have a natural history museum in Bryan? It's behind Target. They have like 12 fossils, but one of them is really cool because it actually has like scales and stuff on it still. It's real cool. I've been there like three times. So. And, that, and that's supposed to prove? Uh, obviously, soft tissue couldn't have been preserved and still be around if they were so old. Something like that. Zach might have more examples of that. Yeah, yeah. So the, the argument goes that uh, if you have soft tissue, such as collagen and whatnot, it degrades over time. And if dinosaurs uh, went extinct 65 million years ago, there's no way that that soft tissue could have been preserved. Um, the lady's name who discovered this, her name is Mary Schweitzer. Uh, and she was also, for the most part, most people thought she was a crank at first, uh, but it was later confirmed she did in fact discover, uh, you know, viable T-Rex blood cells uh, after several million years. Um, but the uh, the thing that they don't tell you, young earth creationists, that is, uh, they really like to harp on all these soft tissue discoveries, but they don't talk about the follow-up studies where they confirm the mechanism of preservation. Uh, namely, it has to do with uh, certain iron oxidation that's uh, been done. I don't remember the exact chemical chain. But if you just look up the name Mary Schweitzer, you can see her publications on it. Um, so, and they were actually, yeah, that's all I had. For those of you in the room, Zach says that there was a lady named Mary Schweitzer who discovered like non-fossilized soft tissue from, he said T-Rex. I don't know if that was just an example, but from a dinosaur. Um, and then demonstrated the mechanism that was used uh, eventually to uh, to preserve soft tissue for such a long period of time. Um, and 
like uh, Barbara, M Barbara McClintock, everybody thought that she was just a crazy initially um, until they kind of proved that it was real. So another cool story of the scientific backlash against something unexpected, which is pretty typical. Funnily enough, I'm pretty certain she was actually a Christian as well. And she got really annoyed about the fact that um, a lot of young earth creationists were using her work to try and prove, the, prove a young earth. And she was like, you don't need to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, that sounds about right. Any other questions? What time is it? I don't know what we're supposed to go till, so just about now. Wait, wait. Okay, so I guess that's it, everybody. Um, I hope that you found this informative. We have been through a lot of material, but uh, don't forget, next week we are going to talk about Adam and Eve. So if you thought this was spicy, that's going to be the real spice, like all the way, an hour and a half on Adam and Eve. And unless something catastrophic happens, Zachary will be up here, and I will be heckling him from the audience. So um, thanks for being here. See you guys next week.